At the time, I came up here working with a band out of Pensacola. We were working for a dude by the name of Papa Don Schroeder. And he had brought Chad to Bob Kirkhoff to record a record called uh, I'm Your Puppet. And at that time, this one had David Hood, Jimmy Johnson. I think Dan Penn that he named. I think he didn't play guitar on it. And forgive me if I'm wrong. But uh, Roger played drums on it. But, you know, you had the basic band. But actually, I think David played trombone on it. We used our bass player for the band of Pensacola. We just kind of combined those musicians with the musicians up here. But what had happened was that Spooner O'Hem had moved to Memphis along with Dan Penn. And there was a spot open for the vacancy open for me to come up and play piano. No sessions. Of which, when I heard that they needed somebody, and then they asked me to come up, I said, done, I'm here. And so I talked to my wife and I said, I said, okay, as long as I can make 100 bucks a week, <laughs> if I can pull in 100 bucks a week, we're moving. So I figured I could do it. So. I take it you made $100 a week? I made 100 bucks a week. <laughs> <laughs> Along with that day, everybody helped me. There was a guy here by the name of Hollis Dixon. He helped a great deal. He put me on a, uh, got me involved in a, uh, a bad driver's club. And we made money there and long, I think, about a trip to plant jobs. And uh, everybody helped me make enough money to stay up here. You know, so thank goodness. Gary, what was life like here as a session musician in Nashville? It's pretty much constant. Is it more casual here or is it less steady? Or what, what, what is the general life of a musician here like? There is not as much pressure. Nashville had so many things going at once, so it's been recorded. <clears throat> then we had two or three sessions going, to, we got to run from one to the other. Here, there wasn't that much pressure. We only had about two or three studios at the most. We only had at the time, at the real hot time, I guess there were maybe two or three sections recording the musicians. Uh, uh, bands that were backing people on the session. So there was this, not this, I've got to get to the session, you know, and I have to get through quick. So people come in here from New York were amazed, uh, from LA and New York, and some people from Nashville said, well, they're going to go away, it's only back. And that's where we got the the term laid back. We didn't care. You know, as long as we had fun doing the show. The only thing we cared about really was losing the momentum of a particular song. You know, we felt like the thing was just there. Almost we felt like the hit was there. We wanted to keep going. We didn't want to uh, we didn't want to slow it down. Because we felt it, you know, we felt it coming. Yeah. Barry, you had studio experience here as well as a musician. You co-owned uh, Muscle Shoals Sound. Mm -hmm. Was that a struggle? Was that a difficult business to be in here? I mean, there was obviously not the volume of recording being done here that there is in other centers. The partner who took care of more of the business aspect of it, Jimmy Johnson, uh, I'm sure had some times every day he was wondering what the next account was coming from. But as far as being a tough business, we had, um, we almost figured out that if we could cut one hit, that would give you five years of work. But that means you've got to cut a lot of hits. And pretty much it ran up that way. So for every hit we cut, we would have about five years of work <coughs> resulting from that hit. So the business, you know, was hard. It was hard. But uh, once you kind of settled down, got into the back of it, it was pretty easy. 
Barry, you did not say, unlike many of the others, you moved on. Why? Uh, you went to Nashville and instead um, of staying in business here. I saw an influx of music that was happening overall, uh, nationwide, that wasn't necessarily coming out of muscle shows, or wasn't influenced by muscle shows, or really wasn't influenced by blues, or by country, really. Uh, it was more group-oriented. It was moving toward a, uh, it's where more groups were making a living, a living being groups as being writers of their whatever uh, song they performed. But at that point, too, you had all these writers uh, and all these musicians, so to speak, locations beginning to disappear. And the work started coming in muscle shows, it became less and less because of the, the type of songs, uh, the type of music the radio would play at the time. So I just saw, I just saw less and less of what I wanted to do happen. And I saw less and less of what was the shows meant uh, happen. Because uh, there was a feeling when we did these things at muscle shows, A feeling, a feeling of comrades, you know, uh, camaraderie, whatever the terminology is. We felt like a fam family, even though, even the artists coming in, even everybody involved felt like, including Rick, including everybody, that we were setting out to cut the head right. That was the thing. So when you lose that family feel to work at that, then you say, well, it now it's become the business. That starts entering the picture. So you start thinking, well, I need money for this, I need money for this to keep the business going. And you start thinking, we're losing the family aspect for the sake of the money. And I couldn't see Puzzle shows surviving beyond doing without effect, so to speak. Uh, it wasn't, it didn't feel like there was 